I'm here with author and activist John Perkins, the co-founder of the nonprofit Dream Change and author of many books, including the New York Times bestseller, Confessions of an Economic Hitman. And we're talking about his latest book, Touching the Jaguar, Transforming Fear into Action to Change Your Life in the World. Welcome, John. It's so great to have you here. It's great to be here with you. Thank you. And I just want to mention, I'm also co-founder of the Pachamama Alliance, which probably some of your listeners know about as a San Francisco-based organization. Right, which I've got to go get more involved in. Now, thank you. And definitely... Um, Definitely uh, let, let me know if all of those, all of the things you do, because there's a lot that you do. <laughs> so, so I loved your book, and it's bringing together your work with indigenous cultures and shamanic practices, uh, global economies, and it offers some clear ideas about uh, actions we can take in order to improve our world. And... Um, for folks who are not familiar with your book, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, could you explain a little bit about what an economic hitman is and the history that led you to your current book, Touching the Jaguar? Yeah, that's a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> Wherever you want to go with that. So I, um, I, when I graduated from business school in the late 60s, I joined the Peace Corps. Uh, and the Peace Corps sent me deep into the Amazon rainforest uh, where in Ecuador. And I stayed in Ecuador in the Peace Corps for three years. And in that time, I studied extensively with shamans. I, as shamans saved my life in the Amazon, that's another story. But, and that's where the idea of touching the jaguar comes from, because one of the things he told me was he said, you know, touching the jaguar means that we, uh, we identify what's holding us back, our fears, our barriers. Mm -hmm. And instead of running from them, we touch them. And when we touch them, they help us change our perception. And as we change our perception, we learn to change our actions. And when we change our actions, we change reality. Right. And the shaman point out, and then I, after, after I left the Peace Corps, I became a, an economist, chief economist at a consulting firm, of what we call an economic hit man, and I'll go into that. But, uh, and I traveled around the world, and, and I've worked, and I, I took time off to study with shamans on every continent ex except Antarctica, where there aren't any. Yeah. And I learned, you know, they all teach us that perception molds reality. And when you come right down to it, that's the basis of modern psychiatry and psychology, and therapy, mm -hmm. and it's the basis of quantum physics. It's the basis of marketing. You know, right. we, we know that, you know, uh, there is no United States. There's, there's no Mexico. There's no culture. There's no religion. Uh, there's no, you've got a picture of, of the Dalai Lama behind her and the, the whole Buddhist, and, and there's no, there's none of this except as we perceive it. And when enough people accept perceptions or codify them into law, they have a huge impact on reality. So that's the teachings of shamanism, but it's also the teachings of modern corporate economics. Hmm. How do we, you know, if I can convince you, if I can give you the perception that unless you own this jacket, you're not going to be successful. <laughs> if, I can convince, right. if I can give you that perception, I'm going to sell a lot of jackets. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, after I left the Peace Corps, I did what I've been trained to do in business school. I became an economist mm -hmm. and chief economist. And my, my job was, I had a large staff working for me, but my job was to identify countries with resources our corporations covet, like oil. And then arrange a huge loan to those countries from the World Bank or one of its sister organizations. The money, though, never went to the country. Instead, it went directly to our own corporations to build big infrastructure projects in that country. Mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. Power plants and industrial parks and ports and, and, and highways. And, and, you know, I thought, because of my training, that what I was doing was a good thing. I thought this at the beginning, anyway, mm -hmm. because... Statistically, we can show that when you invest that kind of money in this kind of infrastructure, the economy grows. What we call the gross domestic product, the GDP grows. And so it happens. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so I thought that what we were doing was helping everybody in the country. But over time, I began to see that that was a lie. That was a perception that we were really helping the very rich. Because in most of these countries, the, the, econ the economic measures are all skewed toward the rich. Even in the United States, you can see today there's, there's three individuals that have as much wealth as half the population of the United States. 
I've done the calculation. If these three individuals made a 10% return on their investments last year, mm-hmm. and half the population of the United States lost 3%, we'd still show a growth in our economy of around 5%. Wow. So GDP is a perception. It's a false perception about overall prosperity. It, it, it measures prosperity of the rich. And I began to see this. But in the meantime, I spent, a good, I spent almost 10 years trying to convince countries to do this, and usually very successfully convincing them to do this, because the presidents of the, of the country and his family and friends owned industry. They owned the commercial establishments. They benefited from more electricity. They benefited from better highways and ports and, and so on, and industrial parks. Mm-hmm. But the poor, the, not even the poor, but the middle class, the majority of the people suffered because money was diverted from uh, health, social services, education, all, all of these sorts of things. Money was diverted from them to pay the interest on the loan. And in the end, they could never buy back the principal on the loan. And so we'd go back in, the economic hitmen under the guise of the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, and convince the country that to get out of it, to, 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 to re- restructure its loans, it had to uh, sell its resource, oil or whatever, real cheap to our corporations uh, without any environmental or social regulations. Mm-hmm. Privatize its schools, its, um, its, its prisons, its utility companies, its water and sewage systems, and sell them to our investors at cut rate prices, or let us build a military base on this, or things like this. So I began over time to understand that what I was doing was, was supporting colonialism, a, a huge new form of colonialism that's based on, was based on debt, on economics, not so much on, on military. And I will have to add also that I always knew and these presidents knew that if they didn't, if they didn't agree to these terms, if they didn't play our game, people we call the jackals would step in. And these were CIA assets that uh, would either overthrow or assassinate leaders of countries. And, you know, the United States is admitted to doing that, unfortunately, in places like Chile with Allende and Arbenz and Guatemala mm-hmm. and Mumba and the Congo and Diem and Ziem and Vietnam and uh, uh, Mossadegh and, and Iran and, and so on and so forth. There's a long, long list. And so my job was pretty easy. You know, convince these leaders to take all this money that would help them and their families become <laughs> richer right. or have somebody step in and overthrow them or maybe assassinate them. Wow. Wow. And you knew, you know, in, in the book, you talk about, um, we, uh, uh, for example, James Roldos, who was assassinated and you, you, he was a client of yours, um, the, the leader of Ecuador at the time. And yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. well, yeah, I had, I've got a little Jaguar here saying, hey, look at that. <laughs> um, <laughs> a jag. I, yeah. So the two, Two of my clients, Jaime Roldos of Ecuador and, and the president of Ecuador, democratically elected, and, and Omar Torrijos of Panama, head of state, yeah. they didn't play the game. Yeah. And, and, uh, and they both went down, and they, were, they died in private plane crashes three yeah. months apart from each other, 1981, that I have no doubt, and most of the world has no doubt, were assassinations. It's never been absolutely proven. There's no smoking gun because an airplane crash destroys the smoking gun. Right. right. It's, a very, it's a very good way to assassinate someone if you decide that that's what your intention, intention is. But um, they, yeah, they, they, but they became models. So presidents throughout the hemisphere, throughout the world, saw this happen. And, and it, was, it served a very strong notice to other presidents that they ought to play the game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, it's surprising to me. You mentioned that, um, you know, the U.S. has admitted to to these, you know, uh, getting involved in these ways, uh, coups and even assassinations. And it's it's surprising to me that the general public, uh, you know, in our country, still doesn't really understand that what we have participated in around around the world. Which is why your your book is so helpful. Um, but and it seems like that we really need to understand that and, and there's a bit of a reckoning and a, and a taking responsibility that needs to happen. Yeah, you know, Kissinger, former Secretary of State Kissinger, has talked extensively about some of these things, mm-hmm. admitting to them, but it's always couched in these terms of, well, 
Mossadegh, uh, Allende, and so on and so forth, these were communists. They were, they were siding with the Soviet Union, which is not true. Uh, and and, and in, in the case of uh, Allende of Chile, he was a socialist, but he, he was no friend of, of the Soviet Union. He, he didn't make them an enemy either, but he was no friend of them. Uh, Mossadegh of, of, of Iran, he, he simply said that the, the, the oil companies that were taking oil out of Iran had to pay a fair share of their profits to the Iranian people. Mm -hmm. He was taken down for that, but he was painted as being this dictator, uh, this Soviet lover, and so on and so forth, which just was not true at all. But again, the perception was out there, and, and the propaganda machine really goes to work uh, to justify taking people out because they don't support American corporate interests, or we should call them global corporate interests, mm -hmm. uh, and they don't support these policies, then they don't help us get the resources that we want. And incidentally, today, um, China is playing a very, very similar game in, in many of these countries and, and actually beating the United States out at it. They're, they're playing the game in some respects more effectively mm -hmm. uh, than we did. Uh, it, so far, but one, one of the things they have not done is build military bases on foreign soil other than what they consider their own sphere of influence, which includes Tibet, unfortunately, and Taiwan and the South China Seas. But, but they've not done that in Latin America or Africa. And they've not assassinated leaders or overthrown governments. They stay out of the politics. They do it all through trade and commerce and, and building infrastructure like we did. But there's another side of it. I think they learned a bit from our mistakes not to be so overt. And I, I, I'm sad to see this, you know, I'm really sad to see that the United States has, has created a situation where, where I talk to leaders in Latin America, I talk to, I spent a lot of time in Latin America in normal years, I spent about three months a year there and I speak Spanish fluently and I've had very good friends and they'll say, you know, we don't want to take loans from the United States anymore, we don't, we don't trust you, but we know you can overthrow us or kill us. And, and, and China's never done that. And do they want our resources? Yes. Are they going to exploit us? Probably. But we also need their help in order to exploit those resources. And we'd rather get the help from them than from a country that we know uh, will build military bases on our soil. Right. Wow. That's really interesting. Um, we've got a long way to go, John, <laughs> you know, to correct these things. And you know, one of the you know, just a, a beautiful part of your book is sharing your experience, you know, deep in the jungles of Ecuador and um, meeting with these indigenous uh, cultures who had had not really had much contact uh, directly with um, people the likes of you, right? And you kind of uh, maybe some, but they were not had not you know it was like you were kind of one of the early guys in there um meeting with them and of course you said that you went in um to sell them on on some stuff that was your job and then you had these remarkable experiences um i'm thinking with the shore people and uh, the shamans there and you kind of learn their way of life and it's really informed you. Can you talk a little bit about what that was like being, being um, amongst these cultures and having these, these experiences and shaman, with shaman, shamans back in the 60s and 70s, right? Yes, well, back, back the late 60s. I, so I went to the Peace Corps in 1968 and I was in Ecuador in the Peace Corps until 71. Mm -hmm. But in the first few months I was in the deep in the jungle there, after a while I got, I got very ill. Right. I couldn't keep any food down. I lost a lot of weight. I, and I reached a point where I, I couldn't even stand up on my own. And to get to the nearest medical facility would have required three days of very difficult travel, including a day of hiking through dense jungle and then another two days of traveling in a rickety old bus up an all terrible dirt road, 10,000 mm -hmm. feet to, up, to the, up to Quito or Cuenca, the, the big cities up in the Andes. Yeah. I couldn't do it. And so one night a shaman offered to heal me. Now, it's 1969. I just graduated from business school. I'd never heard of a shaman. I had no <laughs> idea what, what this meant. But, you know, I would, at that point, I was desperate. I'd try anything. Right. And, and that night he took me on a classic shamanic journey, you know, vision quest. And I'm, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm in his lodge and, and he's, he's chanting and, 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 and I'm, I see in front of me this amorphous 
image. And he yells at me, touch the jaguar. <laughs> well, it's, it's late at night in the middle of the jungle, it's dark. I look all around, you know, like, where's the jaguar? <laughs> this is terrifying. Right. And he says, no, 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 close your eyes and, and see the jaguar and then touch right. it. So I closed my eyes and this amorphous form shape-shifted into a jaguar's face. And I, I reached out and, and touched it. And as I did, I heard this voice. It sounded like my mother saying, son, the food and drink will kill you. And at that moment, I realized, you know, I'm drinking and eating some pretty strange foods. I grew up with very, I grew up in rural New Hampshire with pretty mild, bland foods. Suddenly, I'm eating squirming white grubs that you take out of a, a rotting log, you know, live or a delicacy. And in the Amazon, they don't drink water out of the rivers because the rivers have organic matter. They know this. They can't drink it. So the women make a kind of beer called chicha by chewing manioc root and spitting it. And then you mix water with it. It's alcohol. Yeah. So you mix water with it and it's okay. Right. But I'm drinking a lot of this stuff because you got to rehydrate. I'm eating a lot of squirming white grubs because that's all there was. There was no, yeah. there were no cliff bars. <laughs> <laughs> and I realized on this shamanic journey that every time I ate these foods or drank this spit beer, mm. this voice would say, it's killing you. It's killing you. And at the same time, I saw how amazingly robust and healthy the schwa are. You know, mm. they're, they're hunters and gatherers. That the men have legs that would make a, an Olympic soccer player jealous. <laughs> uh, and, you know, they're built like Tarzan. The yeah. men, women... I was in my early 20s. The women were looking pretty good. Uh, <laughs> and, and people live to be very old if they're not killed in a hunting accident or something like that. So I saw this night that it was not the food and drink killing me. It was my perception. And, you know, the next morning I woke up and I was much better. And, and a few days later, the shaman came to me and he said, you know, you, you're healed. You, you owe me. <laughs> and his demand was that I become his apprentice. Well, 1969, I graduated from business school. There's no future in shamanism. You know, I've never even heard of a shaman before. I had no, no desire, but the guy saved my life. And so I, I studied with him for the next couple of years. And then I went up in the Andes and studied with some Quechua shamans there. And then later on, I was, I traveled around the world. I studied with shamans in Iran and in Egypt and Indonesia and other places. And you know, what I learned was what this shaman originally told me, this idea of touching the jaguar means identifying our barriers, our fears, and, and, and touching them, confronting them, touching them, and then taking their energy and, and changing our perception and then changing our actions. And, and you know, as, as time went on, I learned that this is what, what so much of human life is about, is, is what we create reality through, uh, through our perceptions, and that's shamanism all over the world. But it's also modern economics, modern politics, it's, it's what drives the world. And it had a profound impact on me. And when I left the Peace Corps, you know, I became, I did what I'd been taught to do in business school, which was to become a, an economist. Economic wow. economist. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, I love that story and that idea of touching the jaguar and, and, um, and how, uh, the indigenous peoples are having to touch the jaguar in dealing with us, <laughs> right? And like being willing to deal, see us in a new way. That's been a profound thing too. And, and you know, when I was living with the schwa, they were hunters and gatherers and, and headhunters. They, had, they, they would defend their war with their neighbors, the Achwa, the, the Quechua, the Waranis and even the other Shwa clans, because they have, they were hunters and gatherers and hunters and gatherers need a lot of territory and they don't want anybody interfering with their territory. So that to defend their territories, they would have these wars. They were really more like skirmishes in our, in our lexicon. Um, and then about the time I got there, Texaco came in in, in, in the six, late 60s. And, and very soon after that, the they began to understand, the indigenous people began to understand that their enemies were not their neighbors. It was foreign oil companies. It was foreign mining companies. Mm -hmm. And so they changed their perception of their enemies. It was profound how they did mm -hmm. this. And they went to their neighbors, all, the, all these tribes, the Shwa, the Atwa, the, the Warani, the Quechua, all came together and formed federations to oppose the oil companies, legally, 
politically and physically if need be. Mm -hmm. And then they, they understood that the real enemy was not the companies, but it was the perception behind the companies. These are all dream cultures. They really understand about perception and dreams. And to them, the, the word dream really means perception. It's not just nighttime dreams, it's our perceptions. And they say, the title of one of my books, The World is As You Dream It. And so they understood that what they had to do was change the dream of the modern world that demanded oil, that demanded the minerals that come out of mines, that, 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 that stopping oil companies would never work, that they had to change the dream. And so once again, they saw their, they, they came, they touched their Jaguar, they came to the people they most feared us. They asked me to form a partnership and that became the Pachamama Alliance hmm. to work with them to change the dream of our people and to change the dream of the world. And they said together, we will change the dream of the modern world. And so that's been the quest, and that's what I you know, devoted the rest of my life to once I stopped being an economic hitman in 1981 of, of transforming what we call a death economy, the economic system we've created through a perception of maximizing short-term profits regardless of social environmental costs to a life economy, which is based on a perception of maximizing long-term benefits for people and nature. And it's all about perception. Right, right. Well, you've hit on two, two, two things that I, I want to talk about. One, I just have this quote that kind of that addresses what uh, from the book um, that's talking about this, the world as you dream it. And it was just such a, a poignant point in the book. And it seems like a, a poignant point in your evolution. And you're talking to uh, Numi. I don't know if I have that correct, but he was a, a shaman. And th the quote is, um, he's explaining, he's talking about this idea of the, the world is as you dream it. And he says, the world is as you dream it. Your people dreamed of huge factories, tall buildings, as many cars as there are raindrops in this river. Now you're beginning to see that your dream is a nightmare. And he tells you, all you have to do is change the dream of your people, mm -hmm. which tall yeah. order. Well, <laughs> Right. Yeah, I don't think it is such a tall order to change the dream. Yeah. Uh, you know, if we, if we really look at this dream, this perception of maximizing short-term profits, yeah. it, it really took hold in one moment in 1976 when Milton Friedman won the Nobel Prize in Economics. And his, he, he said a lot of things, and a lot of things that he said were, were accurate and were good. But, but one thing that he said that's caused us all these problems is, and, and this became probably his most important statement, mm -hmm. that the only responsibility is to maximize short-term profits regardless of the social and environmental costs. And I'm paraphrasing, but that's what mm -hmm. he said. And that idea had been growing. Von Heineken had won the Nobel Prize a few years before him, and it had been growing. But when he said it, he had the tremendous impact on the world. He mm -hmm. became an advisor to Reagan and Thatcher and, and in, in Chile, all over the world. He, he became very, very well known. Mm -hmm. And so this was a moment that changed things. And, and so since then, corporate executives have felt, and, and they've been pushed by Wall Street, they've been pushed by their investors to do that, to maximize short-term profits. Mm -hmm. And that's created the problem. Yeah. We, now, and now I think we're, we've been moving for some time in the direction of changing that. The corporations, mm -hmm. benefit corporations, conscious capitalism, the mm -hmm. Green New Deal, so on and so forth. There's so many movements in the direction of moving, of going away from that and moving into a life economy, which is about, uh, you know, uh, maximizing long-term benefits, which is what the indigenous people have always been about, which is what most of our 250,000 years as human beings on this planet, we've, we've lived in life economies until fairly recently. So I think, you know, changing the perception is the first step. Probably the tougher thing is then figuring out the actions that we, that follow that change of perception and making them work. But this pandemic is pushing us more and more in that direction. It really is. It really is. Well, I, you know, I, I'm really glad you, you brought up that, that, you know, the Milton Friedman point and things changing in, in 76, because I, I think, you know, again, our, we've forgotten that, Corporations, you know, back in the, you know, the early 1900s or whenever it was, were far more, I, you know, I dare say the word socialist, but they were more in service to the community than they were about, you know, profiting, if I'm, if I'm remembering that correctly. But it was just, it was a different thing. You know, it was a different thing, the way we looked at, the way corporations worked. And that, and there was this big paradigm shift that has been kind of going full blast since then. 
Yeah, even when I went to business school in, in the late 60s, before going in the Peace Corps, I was taught that a good CEO makes a decent rate of return for investors and also uh, takes care of his customers, provides good, you know, really put, puts a lot at stake in taking care of his customers and his employees, pays them health insurance and retirement pensions. Mm -hmm. And takes good care of the communities where his corporation works. Uh, not only pays taxes, imagine that, doesn't try right. to get paying taxes, but also contributes money to the local education or recreational facilities, that type of thing. That's what I was taught in business school. And then that changed, uh, you know, less than 10 years later in 1976. And, and again, there'd been this growing trend toward it, but, but Milton Friedman winning the Nobel Prize in economics really, really uh, put the nail in the coffin of, of the old way of thinking about being a responsible citizen for corporations and instead focusing totally on short-term profits, which as it turns out is insane. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and contrary to what most human beings have, have believed throughout our history. Right, right, because there's no longevity <laughs> in it at, at the very least. Um, um, you know, can you, can you talk a little bit more about uh, life economy and how you see that? Yeah, so a life economy is an economic system that cleans up pollution, pays people to clean up pollution rather than create more pollution, mm -hmm. pays people to regenerate destroyed environments rather than destroying more environments, to recycle and to create new technologies that, that, that use the wind and, and the sun more effectively even than we are today. And, and things we can't even envision necessarily at this point. But it's not a, we're not talking about going back and living in caves. We're not talking about people not having jobs. We're talking about more people having more jobs and more satisfying jobs that actually do good things. Right. You know, and you know, this, this, in the book, I, I have a long list of things and, and examples. But here's one example. So you, you, if you're an American citizen, about $54 of every $100 you pay in taxes, in the discretionary budget goes to the US military in one way or another. 54% of your taxes go to killing people or right. trying to kill people. And imagine if, if some of that went, you could, the same corporations, you could pay Raytheon and General Dynamics to instead of making missiles and weapons of destruction, mm -hmm. to instead make equipment that would clean up all the microplastic in the oceans, that would mine that stuff. Mm -hmm. And imagine if we paid companies in, to hire people to regenerate all the old mine pits around the world to to reprocess oil that's been spilled at every oil drilling site and in every gas station that, uh, around the world. Uh, there's so many opportunities here to create an economic system that is truly a renewable resource. And and I, I dare say that, uh, you know, I've talked with engineers at places like Raytheon and General Dynamics about this. And these are great engineers, brilliant, extremely talented, they tell me they would be much happier making that kind of thing than, than making military equipment. I mean, basically they're engineers, so they do what they're told to do right. and they do it brilliantly. Yeah. But, but in their hearts, they can think, well, yeah, would, I would much rather support life for my children and grandchildren than, than to make things that, that destroy life yeah. or the planet. Right, right. Well, you know, you mentioned uh, COVID and it having uh, some effect on on moving towards a life economy. How are you seeing that? Well, here's a story that, uh, so there's a, a lady shaman high in the Andes of, of Ecuador that I take, I, I take people, groups of people to, um, to work with shamans every year. Uh, and uh, her name, she has a great name of Maria Juana. <laughs> I'm Berla. And a number of years ago, somebody asked her, and I'm translating, um, so Maria Juana, how do we save the earth? And she laughed, you know, and she said, well, the earth's not in danger, but we are, we humans and some other species, a lot of other species will take with us. But you know, she said, we're just like so many fleas. And if we get to be too much of a nuisance, she'll just shake us all off. Mm -hmm. And then Maria Juana points up at this big volcano that hovers over her home in Babura. And she says, you know, a few years ago, that volcano was covered with an ice cap. It isn't anymore. 
Pachamama, Mother Earth, is twitching. She hasn't shaken us off yet, but she's twitching. Yeah. And you know, every time that a major hurricane hit or these terrible fires that have been hitting the west coast of the United States and, and, and the Amazon and Australia and the hurricanes threatening us, every time one of those once in 100 year events that seems to happen every day now yep. <laughs> uh, hit us, I thought about that. I thought about marijuana. But I also realize that people are taking these events as very local. So if you survive the fire, if you survive the hurricane, you expect that within a few days or maybe it's going to take a couple of weeks, but you're going to get help from the outside world, bottled water, food. Uh, you're going to be encouraged to rebuild. And it's local. But the pandemic is global. Mm -hmm. It's hit everybody on this planet. The people deep in the Amazon are being hit by this. Mm -hmm. It's hitting all of us. There is no outside world. We're being shown. Pachamama is twitching very hard now. Mm -hmm. And she's twitching in a way that we've all got to listen to. And I, I have to say, if we don't listen, if we think we can go back to rebuilding the old normal, mm -hmm. we hit harder again. That's and right. and we've, got to, we've, we've got to create a new normal, which is the life economy. We've got to move out of the system that's so destructive. There's no question. I, I don't know how anybody can question climate change at this point. Uh, there's no question that we're having a huge impact on this planet. Mm. Our economy is, and our economy is us. You know, and the economic system is a social system, basically. Right. So we need to change. Uh, we need to change our perception and our actions. And we're being told that so strongly. And you can look at this as a shamanic message that comes from somebody like Maria Wano, who says the earth is speaking to us, Gaia is speaking to us. Or you can look at it totally scientifically and say, well, look at the satellite photography that shows, you know, that suddenly over Beijing, they can see stars at night when they couldn't before, or over LA or whatever. And you can see now how this, uh, where I live on the west coast of the United States, uh, up off of the coast of Washington, the state of Washington, Outside my window right now, there's tremendous amounts of smoke. My, the place I live is not on fire. I live on an island. But I'm being impacted by, by these fires that are sweeping the whole West Coast. I mean, and, and they're worse every year. Right. There's no, there's no, we've got to confront this jaguar. We've got to under, confront this fear. Right. And as we confront this fear, this fear tells us, hey, listen change your perception of what it means to be successful humans on this planet. Stop building this ridiculous economic system that's built on short-term profits and short-term consumer materialistic maximization for individuals. And come up with something new, come on. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Scientists, scientifically it's telling us and shamanically it's telling us the same thing. Yeah, it's all coming together now, which does, does, seem, does seem new. Um, you know, I, you tell this great uh, story, this legend um, of the legend of the, and I'm going to probably mispronounce it, but the legend of the Evias? Yes, Evias. <laughs> Evious. No. Yes, that's right. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Tell, tell me the. Tell me the. I'll get it right. Yeah. Yeah. Evious. It's a Schwa story and an Atwa story. Their neighbors tell the same story. They share a language also, and it it says that, um, you know, there's these Evious, giant white cannibals that live up in the mountains, and for years they they didn't cannibalize the people at all. Mm -hmm. The people lived very idyllic lives, and the people being the Schwa, the Atwa. And then one day the, the, the cannibals started coming down and cannibalizing them. They're huge giants, and even the strongest warriors, and the Schwa and the Atwa are these amazing warriors, but they couldn't, they couldn't fight them. They, were, they, they, they weren't strong enough to fight them. And then one day this, this warrior came down the river in a dugout canoe with, his friend, with a couple of buddies, and his name was, was uh, uh, Etza. And he said, I'm here to save you from the Evias. Well, the people couldn't believe that he could do this, even though he was big and strong. But he said, you know, I get to go up there by myself. I'm not taking my friends with me. I get to do this alone. I got to go up there by myself. And he went up into the mountains and he disappeared for a number of days. And the Schwa, the Atwa became convinced that he was dead and that the Evias would come back down. But for the moment, the Evias weren't coming. But eventually, Etza came back and he said, you know, he said, I've re worked out a deal with the Evias. They won't come and attack you anymore, but you've got to give them your best meats when your hunters go out and kill 
animals. You've got to give them the best meat, and your women have to make them lots of chicha and give them <laughs> the, best, the best fruits and vegetables. You, you grow in your gardens, and that they won't leave you alone. So the Shwa, the Atwa agreed to this. But after a while, they started starving themselves. They couldn't continue to do this. They, 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 the Yivyas were demanding so much food. And so they went back to Edson and they said, we can't continue. And Edson said, well, I can teach you a way to totally get rid of them. But you've got to, you've got to it's, it's a deal. You've got to agree to something. And they said, oh yeah, anything. And he said, well, have you noticed that your populations have been growing and as they grow, you've been destroying the forests and you've been killing off the animals. Uh, you're destroying your own environment. <laughs> and they said, oh, they looked around and said, yeah, we, we've kind of noticed that. And that's it said, you have been to the forests what the evias are to you. You've been cannibalizing nature. You've got to stop. You've got to practice birth control. <laughs> and yeah. And he said, I'll teach you some ways. And, and they, they did, and they, they knew some ways. But he said that if you fail at this, then you need to go to war with your neighbors to keep your populations down. You need to, you need to weed your gardens, just like your women weed your manioc gardens. Mm -hmm. you know, so they take out some plants so the others can flourish. You're going to have to do that with your populations if you don't succeed. And he, then he taught them how to make traps and poison food and poison chicha to give to the evias and get rid of the evias. Yeah. But now they're saying, they say that we are the evias or we're symbolic, we're the metaphor for the evias, fight cannibals and giant, <laughs> giant oil rigs that they saw, those look like the evias to them. Right. And they say that they're being punished because they didn't keep down their populations and, and they didn't. And in a way, they, one of the reasons they didn't was because uh, missionaries and, and schools came in and taught them that they, they could no longer uh, practice warfare. And the missionaries taught them they couldn't practice birth control, that if they were gonna have sex and they had to do it to procreate, not, not, not just for pleasure, which is what they, they I mean, they, they, they've always been very sensual, sexual people. Um, and so their populations grew and grew too big. And so now they're saying that the legend of the Evias is being replicated. And I think it's fair to say that it's being replicated around the world, that that is a microcosm for what's happening. We are cannibalizing our planet. We, we human beings are cannibalizing our planet. And now we're paying the price. Absolutely. Um, that it is a metaphor. Um, for what's going on around the world. And, you know, one of the, thi one of the, it, it's also a, a description of life economy, right? You know, it's, a, it's at least it's a, a, an aspect of life economy. And it's so amazing to think of, of birth control being um, about balance, which is life economy. And one aspect that, that you included in there that, that I thought was really interesting um, is that they, I, I think I've got this right, there's, you have the choice of birth control as man, maintaining your populations or war. So fighting, you know, killing each other. And yeah. we've got that too. I, I'd add a third one there, uh, back to marijuana's thing, which is that, and then the earth can just get tired, done with us, <laughs> you know, and then. And, and yeah, and, and I, you know, that may be, I, I think if we don't listen, Mm -hmm. to this pandemic, which is really bad. And not just the pandemic that's bad, it's all the turmoil that's causing, you know, all the, the demonstrations around the world and the political turmoil and so on and so forth. And, and, and you know, a huge threat to democracy in countries like the United States and, and, and other countries, Brazil and other countries. And um, so it's causing huge disruption. There's no question. And, and at the same time, we're, we're seeing all these fires and all these climatic problems, but we're getting, we're really, really being shaken. And yeah. if we don't listen, uh, we're gonna be hit a lot harder. It, it could be our extinction. Uh, you know, it wouldn't be the, wouldn't be the first time that uh, species has gone extinct by any means. And, no, no. Um, or maybe not entirely extinct, maybe, but maybe where our cultures are totally changed. I, I take people to the, to the Maya of Guatemala and, you know, the, the, one of their teachings is that they did, they went through exactly this back before the year 900. They had these huge 
vast cities, huge pyramids, spectacular. And, and, and they destroy their environment in the process. They cut the forest, they drain the swamps, mm -hmm. and they change the climate. And finally, the people just gave up and left the cities and went up into the mountains and into the jungles and left the, the royalty and, and the priest uh, classes to stay in their cities and die, whatever they did. They don't even know what they did. They went back, though. They went back into nature. Mm -hmm. and, and nature took over uh, these pyramids. And so for hundreds of years, nobody even knew there were pyramids. These huge pyramids, 20 stories high or more, covered with trees. They, we, we, people thought they were mountains. They were, and now they've been excavated, some of them. And, we, and the, the Mayan shamans are taking us in and saying, hey, look, this is the microcosm. We've been through it. Mm -hmm. We destroyed, our people destroyed our world. And now it's being taken to the total global level. And so learn the lesson of the Maya. Learn the lesson I, of the Evias. <laughs> so, right. so many examples. Right, right. Um, well, you have an organization, uh, you mentioned the, that you co-founded the Pache Mama Alliance and also Dream Change. Um, can you like to talk a little bit about one or both of those and what, you, what you're doing in the world? Well, both of those are dedicated to changing the dream of the modern world, making mm -hmm. it more, as the mission statement of the Pache Mama Alliance says, and, and I think Pache Mama's mission statement is very, I mean, Dream Change's mission statement is very similar mm -hmm. to uh, create a more environmentally sustainable, spiritually fulfilling, socially just human presence on this planet. And, you know, I'd, I'd go beyond and say, well, then the practical way to do that is to transform the death economy into a life economy. Mm -hmm. And we, we do that through many, many, many ways. We have a lot of different programs. And I, I would just suggest that people go to dreamchange.org or pachamama.org, pachamama, P-A-C-H-A-M-A.org. Um, and design. I'll be sure to link to those on the on the um, our website. So great. Or you can go to my, my website also, just johnperkins.org and find it all there. Right. But we've had tremendous success at Pachamama Alliance now I think has its changing the dreamer programs, which are very powerful in uh, close, close, not, about 90 countries, maybe either a few more or a few less, <laughs> give or take. But yeah. It's really spread around the world. And it, it all, all of, the, all of it comes from the message that was given from these indigenous people in the Amazon who, who asked us to join with them, to touch the jaguar of what they feared to help us change our dream and work with us to make that happen. So they are our true founders uh, in both of those organizations. I, you know, we claim to be co-founders. I'm, co I'm a founder of Dream Change and co-founder with Bill and Lynn Twist at Pachamama Alliance, but really the founders are the indigenous people. Hmm. It's wonderful. Now, when we started our, our conversation today, um, you said, uh, and we were, and you noticed His Holiness, the Dalai Lama behind me, you said, ask me about if I have any regrets. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you now about any regrets. Funny story about the Dalai Lama, a little background first. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I took a group to Ladakh. Yeah. You know, northern India is a protector. It used to be part of Tibet, but unlike the Tibet that's under the Chinese rule, uh, the Dalai Lama can go to, to Ladakh. And he was there at the same time, this group of about 30 people I, I, I was leading up there. And uh, we tried to arrange a, a, a private get together with him, but it, it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And then the last day that we were leaving Ladakh, uh, flying from Leh Ladakh to Jammu, India, got up very early in the morning, sitting in the airport, waiting for our plane. And the Dalai Lama comes through the airport with his entourage. And under his arm, he's got my book, Shapeshifting. Wow, really? <laughs> and trying to entice him to meet with us, you know, and he accepted the book and then he'd sent us his books, but now he's got it under his arm. So I end up sitting next to him on the airplane, to make a long story short, in the front seat of the plane on this flight. And uh, it, was a, it was a fascinating experience. Uh, there's a lot of great stories around things that he said at the time about the, the legend of the, 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 uh, the 14th Dalai Lama, which is what he is. But, but as a result of that, he then at the end of the flight invited us to his house, my, uh, the whole group of 33 people in Damsala, India, a couple of days later. And so we were there, we spent the afternoon with him, just us, our 33 people and him and a couple of his assistants. Uh, he, he speaks pretty good English, but he has an interpreter there with him. And, um, you know, one of the people asked him whether he had any regrets about leaving Tibet. And he, looked, and he says, you know, 
regrets, and he said, this is for all of you, not just for me, but this is for all of you. Regrets are a waste of time. Don't have any regrets, but do learn yeah. from, from the things that you've done and change your perception around, around all of that. Change your perception. So rather than having regrets, look at, look at what good comes out of it. He says, you know, you people wouldn't be here with me probably if I hadn't been forced out of Tibet. You probably never would have heard of me, <laughs> which right. is probably true. And, you know, it was, a, it, was a, it was a beautiful teaching. He said, don't, don't have regrets, but do, do change your perceptions and change your actions and, and learn from, from whatever happened. Uh, and I think that's so important. Basically, he's saying, touch your Jaguar, touch your Jaguar. Yeah. And, you know, and the benefits that have come out of that. And I have to say, looking at this picture behind you of, of his holiness, that what a remarkable example he is of someone who meditates for several hours every day or most every day and then also takes the incredible actions i mean this guy has written hundreds of books i think certainly dozens i think hundreds and it seems as though everywhere i go to speak for this in europe or latin america the dalai lama has just been there or he's yeah. on the way you know it's like <laughs> right. he travels around he speaks he's so active yeah. so he has really made this connection between spirituality and action and and one you know one of the other things that was asked of him is so your holiness uh, somebody had recommended that everybody get together and pray for uh, ten minutes on a certain day at a certain time around the world and somebody asked him so your holiness what do you think of this idea and he said well you know prayer is good meditation is good that's important but if that's all you do it's probably a waste of time and maybe worse because it distracts you, it may distract you. So if you walk away from that 10 minutes of prayer, you say, I've done my job, um, that's a big mistake. What we need to do is pray, and we also need to take action every single day. And I think that was so important for him to point that out, and, and he does that so beautifully. He prays, he meditates every day, and he takes action every day. And that brings together, you know, and in a way it brings together my books on, shamanism and spirituality with the ones on economics and global intrigue how do these tie together they, they tie together because we realize that we have to have we have to change our perceptions and then we have to take actions that reflect our new perception of what it means to be human on this earth mm -hmm. and when we do that we change reality right right what a lovely story what a lovely story and um and His Holiness also brings in the, the you know, he's, he's quite a proponent of science, you know? He, so he's, he, and he, he carries a lot too. It's, I think, just remarkable, his understanding of what it takes to, to try to preserve his culture and, and the culture for his people and to meet this world in this huge way of, you know, this, you know, all the, the, just in a huge way, <laughs> you know, it's, it's really remarkable. And he has so much fun doing it. Yeah. And, and he has such a great sense of humor. I think that's another message is that we need to have fun. And in Touching the Jaguar, I, I talk about this daily practice that everybody can do for seven or eight minutes every day or once a week or whatever. But part of it is identifying what you most want to do for the rest of your life. What will give you the greatest pleasure, the greatest joy because we need to go into this with a sense of bliss. Mm -hmm. You know, if we don't, if we don't do what we enjoy doing, yeah. uh, we're never really successful. I never really enjoyed being an economic hitman mm -hmm. I, for 10 years. I thought I enjoyed it because I've been taught that's what I should do and I'm making lots of money and traveling first class around the world, realizing the American dream, but I wasn't happy. Right. I didn't get it. Now, I about my life to writing and talking and speaking out like this and i'm ecstatic you know it's 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 great fun it's, it's not that there aren't some tough moments when you got to do the, the tough editing and so on right. so <laughs> hanging out in airports for long periods of time back yeah. when the airports open right uh, and but but it's 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 my bliss and i think it's it's a really important message that the dalai lama sends too is he really enjoys what he does you can see it in his smile and his attitude and this great sense of humor and does it with such gusto and and uh, I, I think that's a very important message also well it it's it's so so wonderful talking with you and you you have a lot of gusto and it too and i'm uh wondering you know what's next 
what's next for you? Well, I keep, I'll keep writing, and, and right now I'm, I'm, I'm working on a book that, that looks at, at, at the rise of China, mm -hmm. and what that means for the world, or what that oh, may, wow. may mean for the world, because uh, whether we like it or not, it's a jaguar, we give my jaguar, it's, yeah. a, it's a jaguar we've got to touch, yeah. uh, but China, it, the United States is in decline as an empire. And we can, I think we can reassume a leadership role, but we've got to work on it. We, we, we've lost a lot in the last few years of respect around the world, and the Chinese have taken advantage of that. And they're making huge inroads. This, this, silk, this new Silk Road, which is called the Belt, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. Mm -hmm. The Belt is actually physical transportation systems that are being built all over Asia, the Middle East and Africa and Europe to connect China with these places. The road are the sea roads and the air roads that are, that are connecting them with Latin America and the Caribbean and, and the island states in North America. So China is, is, is on the march. There's no question about it. And we can complain about it. We can fear it. We can, you know, but it's a Jaguar. We have to touch and see that it's happening. And what do we do with that? Mm -hmm. So, so I really want to explore that in the next book is, is how do we relate that? And I'm not justifying China doing it. It's, it's mm -hmm. like, here it is. It's a fact. It's happening. And, and how do we look at it? How do we relate to it? What is our perception around that? And how does that mold the actions that we take? Oh, I'm looking forward to that. I'm oh, really looking forward to that. Well, John, it's been such a such a pleasure meeting you and getting to talk to you today. And I hope you'll come back. Well, I'd love to. I'd love to. Yeah. yeah. It's been a great pleasure. And thank you for all you do. It's so important what you're doing. I just deeply, deeply appreciate it.